Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for these, these wonderful opportunities that you continue to give us to feast upon your word together. I just ask that you would filter out all that which is not of you, all of that which is foolish and ignorant but sealed to our hearts, the truth of your word, the truth that you would have us know, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, in our Wednesday night services, we are st studying parables. Lord willing, this coming Sunday, we will begin a new study in the epistle, the second epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. So we've been looking at parables and we've, I think this is about the fourth or fifth video on that and we've, we've looked at, at quite a few. I pointed out how that uh, in context is extremely important. One of the greatest hindrances to us not understanding uh, these parables is our failure to distinguish between God's program for Israel and God's program for the church, uh, that distinction uh, in theological terms is called dispensationalism. Uh, the word dispensation or dispensationalism uh, is basically a theological term that 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 looks at the the various ways in which God dealt with his people uh, down through the ages there are seven major dispensations uh, beginning in, in the Garden of Eden uh, before the fall the the dispensation of innocence and so we come to these parables in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, primarily. Uh, we spent some time looking at those in Matthew. There are parallel verses in, in, in Mark and Luke. Uh, and, and in just about in every case, in every instance, what we're looking at is a time in which uh, Jesus taught through these parables. Uh, so that those who had ears to hear would understand and those who did not would not. Uh, it's extremely important to understand and remember, always keep in mind that, uh, that at, these, at this particular time that, that these were spoken, there was no church. You and I were not even in the picture. Uh, if we keep that in mind as we as we uh, approach these parables, then we'll, we'll uh, do a whole lot better in understanding the context. There is a, a movement today that is uh, strongly opposed to uh, a pre-tribulational rapture. Uh, one of the the benefits of, of understanding, uh, or how should I say it, one of the, uh, the primary reasons why we, we at least uh, most believers who are uh, involved in these type studies, what, where that they come to understand that, that pre-trib is the only uh, position that will hold up to uh, the scrutiny, or, or it will, it's the only one that will stand the test of sound biblical uh, uh, sound biblical. I'm looking for the right word here. Sound biblical doctrine. Uh, the reason why mid-trib and post-trib 
do fail that test and they don't and it doesn't stand up to sound biblical doctrine is is primarily the fault of uh, the Bible student not understanding or, or making that distinction between God's program for Israel and God's program for the church and when we make that right distinction we can understand these parables a lot easier uh, well, and at the same time, we come to realize that uh, uh, much of, of what we may have formerly thought the, the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, was referring to the rapture, was not referring to the rapture at all, but the second coming. The church was a mystery. I want to draw a few contrasts before we get into our, our parable that we're going to talk about here. Uh, and, and why that the rapture cannot be post-trib. In other words, at the end of the tribulation, uh, Christ returns once. There, is no, there really is no rapture that we just all go through the trib. The church goes through the tribulation and, and then Christ returns and, and we're, we're caught up together, I guess, with Him in the air to meet, him, meet the Lord in the air uh, at the second coming. Uh, and there's a lot that could be said about mid-trib as well. I mean, if if, uh, if post-trib fails, fails the, this uh, doesn't stand up to the test of sound biblical thesis, uh, then neither does mid-trib. But I want to draw a few contrasts first here. These are fairly simple to understand. Uh, I'm going to be contrasting the rapture with the second coming here. At the rapture, Christ appears only to the church. At the second coming, He appears to all. At the rapture, we're caught up in the air. At the second coming, Christ returns to earth. At the rapture, Jesus comes to claim a bride at the second coming, he returns with a bride. At the rapture, the church is removed and the tribulation begins. At the second coming, Christ establishes his kingdom. When we're looking at, when we're talking about the church, the, the rapture is imminent. The rapture could occur at any time. When we're looking at or talking about the second coming, the second coming is preceded by a multitude of signs. Because if you are in the uh, tribulation period and you look around you and you see what's going on, you, you can directly, you can see this directly spoken of in Scripture. When we're talking about the rapture, we're talking about a message of comfort. And when we're talking about the second coming, we're, we're talking about a, a message of judgment. The rapture pertains to the church. The second coming pertains to Israel and the Gentiles, the world. The rapture is said to be a mystery. Uh, the second coming, however, is predicted in both the Old, Old and New Testaments. At the rapture, believers are judged. Uh, there's no condemnation. We're judged according to our works and uh, rewarded on that basis. Uh, but believers are judged at the rapture. At the second coming, Israel and the Gentiles are judged at the rapture the creation is basically left unchanged I understand there'll be a lot of calamity but the creation itself is basically unchanged uh, at the second coming however that that second coming entails a change in creation that is beyond anything the world's ever saw 
At the rapture, Israel's covenants remain unfulfilled. And at the second coming, all Israel's covenants are fulfilled. At the rapture, it, that, that rapture occurs before the day of wrath. And of course, at the second coming, it follows the day of wrath. The phrase commonly used to you know, refer to our present dispensation is that the Lord is at hand. When we're looking at the, at the second coming, however, uh, the phrase that is associated with that is that the kingdom is at hand. The earthly kingdom is at hand. At the rapture, we're taken into Christ's presence. And at the second coming, they are taken into the kingdom. And that's what we're going to be talking about here in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. So I'm going to go ahead and read this. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods, and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents for unto every one that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth and so ends the reading of the parable. I want you to take note of a few things as, as, as we look at this. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. That word there, dearly beloved, is harsh. Uh, basically what he's saying is that you're a hard and you're a cruel taskmaster. 
reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. Now taking, taking into consideration the context, I'm going to suggest that the sense of this parable here is fairly obvious. Uh, basically what the wicked servant is saying is, I knew that you were one that was impossible to serve. Now, now as, I, as I say these things, I want you to try if you can to keep in mind even though we are in a different context here, the similarity in what is being said by, by the wicked servant and what we often hear people say today. I knew that you were one that was impossible to serve, one whom I could never please. You're always demanding uh, from me what what I, I can't do or I couldn't do. You, you, you're always dissatisfied with what I was able to do. I'm going to suggest, dearly beloved, that all sinners secretly think of God as some hard, cruel, taskmaster. And they basically blame, as, as the wicked servant is doing here, they basically blame God for their own failure. They, they look on Him as unreasonable. They look on Him as tyrannical. So I take that text to contain a promise of, of increase of grace to those that have been given grace. Uh, we read about that in Paul. Grace upon grace. Whereas in the case of others, it won't last. There's no sustaining power. No man's talents or gifts will be of any profit to him in the day of judgment. So therefore, being basically, as we would probably say today, good for nothing, which is really sad. Angels take him and cast him into outer darkness where there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That weeping and gnashing of teeth has, there are several verses that contain that phrase and in every single case we're looking at a wicked servant, one whom he never knew, one whom was not a member of the family of God. So, he's turned out of doors into, into uh, outer darkness and try if you can to imagine, and I, I pointed this out in a previous parable about the wedding banquet or the wedding feast or that I, I suggested this was a parabolic picture of the thousand year reign of Christ. Uh, many, many, uh, Many Bible students, Bible professors, teachers, college professors, uh, pastors, uh, a great number of uh, Bible scholars today agree on that one fact, and that is that the wedding banquet is a parabolic picture of the thousand year reign of Christ. If you're, if you're looking at or thinking of the wedding feast or the wedding banquet 
as something which just lasts for a day or two or a few hours, you're missing, you're missing the bigger picture. This is parabolic language. And so the kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ, the theocratic kingdom, uh, I mentioned that word theocratic on Facebook this morning uh, in the context of a discussion which was about our current political system composed of several parties, uh, independent, libertarian, Democrat, Republican, and so on and so forth. And, and I basically made a comment. I said something to the effect that I was a... Uh, you know, how that we were looking forward to a theocracy. You know, just it's that one fact alone that pretty much keeps me out of politics and, and, and you know, keeps me from having any desire whatsoever to run for mayor or governor or, or, or anything like that. A theocracy. It's uh, from the word theos, uh, God. Uh, Theocratic, it's, a, it's, it's basically a, a system in which God rules. And we know that we rule and reign with Him for a thousand years. Uh, many suggest that, or there's quite a few that suggest that, that rule and reign with, reigning with Christ doesn't end at the thousand years, but that we continue to rule and reign with Christ throughout eternity. Uh, that's the position that I take on that. It really does put our current politics in perspective. You know, if you're looking for uh, for there to be some some good positive change come about as a result of the world's current politics, I think you're 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 sort of uh, hoping in the wrong direction. But these individuals are turned out of doors into outer darkness. And if you can imagine the light of the kingdom, the banquet, the, uh, uh, the wedding feast, it's, it's when Christ introduces His bride because we return with Christ at the second coming. We've been raptured seven years prior. And we return with Him at the second coming. The church does. And if we're going to be completely honest with biblical prophecy, we, we have to understand that to be put out into outer darkness is you know where the angels this is this is this explains this explains the parable of the two workers in the field where one is taken and the other is left many confuse that with the rapture they think that's talking about the rapture it's not talking about the rapture we're we're past the rapture we're in the tribulation period two workers in the field uh one's taken the other left two grinding in, at the mill uh, one's taken the other left. If you were there at that time, you would want to be left, not taken. Whereas at the rapture, you want to be taken. Because the angels will go to the four ends of, you know, north, east, south, west, the four corners of the earth. They'll gather up the non elect uh, just as the tear is gathered at the end of the age up in bundles and burn. I guess what makes my position different than many others on this is that I do not believe that when Christ returns and those who are not His are gathered by these angels, they're not, they're not gathered up to be put at that time in hell. That's where I would differ from many others on this subject. 
I do not think that that's what the text is saying. I'm going to make another suggestion, and you can do with it that what you want. Uh, I don't ask anyone to agree with me here on anything. In fact, it's you. You're, you're, it could be extremely dangerous to do so. But I'm going to tell you what I think. They're turned out of doors into outer darkness. With, with all the other unhappy, miserable creatures who are in the same predicament, crying over their miserable condition, they're reflecting on their past conduct, while they see faithful, diligent servants uh, inside the kingdom, partaking of the kingdom prepared by their Lord, where that their joy is unspeakable and full of glory. And they are a witness to this. Try to imagine if you can being left behind at the rapture. The rapture occurs, let's say it occurs on a Sunday, everybody's in church and half the, the congregation disappears. And the other half is sitting there They're not sitting there because they weren't a good enough Christian, because they didn't study enough, believe enough, pray enough, uh, repent hard enough, or any other thing. They were left there because they were simply never baptized into the body of Christ. It's not, the rapture is not based on merit as so many Christians today so wrongly believe. It's not that Christ takes the good Christians, leaves the bad Christians to go through the tribulation period. Dearly beloved, we are members of His body, bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh. For God to subject one single Christian to the wrath of God's, of Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble, for them to go through the tribulation period as believers in Christ, where that Christ is living within them, would be for the Father to subject His own Son to the wrath of that period. Doesn't happen. Won't happen. Cannot happen. Okay? If you may be today an elect child of God, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, but destined, destined to be delivered, you've already been redeemed, but you were never a member of His body, the church, but, it, but that does not mean that you were not de redeemed and that you will, and so you will, you will go find yourself in the tribulation period, and you will be delivered out of that, saved during that tribulation period. You have to be, if you're His. Now, if you're not, and I want you to try to imagine being left behind at the rapture to go into the tribulation period to now. find yourself at the end of the tribulation period not being able to enter into that glorious kingdom. I believe, I'm going to suggest that this is what the parable is talking about. This is who these people are that he's speaking of. This is the wicked servant. Okay? Just as the unwise virgins, which I, su I suggested strongly in a previous video, we're not looking at foolish and wise virgin Christians in this present age. The context is the tribulation period where the, those who had oil in their lamp were those who were His, those 
who did not were not. And so the door was closed to the kingdom. They were unable to enter in. If there was someone there, the, in the parable, you know, describes a, a person who didn't have on a wedding garment. Didn't have a wedding garment on. We understand that our garment is the righteousness of God in Christ. That we put off the old man, that we put on the new man, that was created in righteousness and holiness and truth. I've spent a great deal of time talking about the old man and the new man, the contrast between the two, how that the old man, that's all it does is sin. The new man cannot sin. So the context reveals this to be speaking to those in the tribulation period who do not enter the kingdom. This wicked servant is put into outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we read that and we automatically assume that he's just picked up by these angels, not allowed to go into the kingdom, but dropped immediately into hell. And I'm not so sure that that's what that's saying. I am more inclined to believe that they are put outside the kingdom in outer darkness. And darkness, yes, be, why? Because darkness, why? Well, don't think of that literally. I mean, the sun may be shining, but they're in outer darkness. The darkness being, you know... Uh, a metaphor for spiritual blindness, spiritual darkness, the weeping and the wailing. Uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's, that's an interesting phrase. If I don't have time to go into it in this video, but if you, if you care to look at that, look at all the, the passages which talk about weeping and... and uh, uh, and gnashing of teeth. It certainly has its connections to eternal judgment. But I think that they're put out. They're not allowed to go into the kingdom. They are put out outside that glorious kingdom of Christ on earth are not allowed to go into that kingdom and or partake of that kingdom. Like the, the kingdom is not just restricted. I don't believe the kingdom of uh, the millennial kingdom will be restricted to a geographical area such as Palestine, but it will be global and uh, So geographically, they're there, but spiritually, they're not. And they're left to die, live out their lives, die a natural death, where that they then will sleep until that second resurrection the resurrection of the damned at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. That's the position that I have to take here on this parable. It's not surprising, folks, to understand, to see that when we go through these parables, that primarily, I mean, in the main, the majority of them, of all of these parables, have to do with both Israel and the kingdom as well as the Gentiles during that period, but not our present period today. Now, is there a present application here of us being a, a, a servant uh, a good servant? as opposed to a wicked sir. You know, uh, what we do with what God gives us, 
as opposed to, you know, us doing nothing but burying it in a hole someplace. I have to take the position, and it is unpopular as it may be, to suggest that the first two servants that were talked about, one, the one, okay, the one with the, the five talents, the one with the two talents, uh, this is describing God's people. This is what God's people do. You, you can't make, you can't divide the body of Christ up here and say, well, okay, some of us in the body of Christ, some of us are good servants, faithful servants, and some of us are wicked servants. Can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. So that was the parable of the talents. We see that in Matthew 25. Uh, next uh, Wednesday night, This, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to go through uh, as many parables as we can. We'll make Wednesday night. A, it's, I've been wanting to get on the schedule for the longest time. I don't know why I haven't, didn't do it earlier. It, it makes it a whole lot easier on everyone involved, uh, I think. Uh, uh, it's, it's a little more study for me, but, but that doing 2 Second Corinthians on Sunday morning, uh, every Sunday morning, instead of twice a week, as I was doing before, uh, verse by verse, twice a week, uh, it gives me more time to study and to prepare for that Sunday message. And then, uh, and so that's the schedule that we're, we, I hope, Lord willing, we will abide by. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.